Professor Warren Goldfarb, Chairman of the Philosophy Department at Harvard University, is our guest panelist in this program. He specializes in logic, history of logic, and philosophy of mathematics, and has translated and edited the logical writings of Jacques Herbrand. He has also co-authored with Burton Drebin, The Decision Problem and Solvable Classes of Quantificational Formulae. The program begins with a discussion of Professor Quine's early philosophical career at Harvard and consideration of his relationship with the logical positivists of the Vienna Circle, most notably with Rudolf Carnap. This background sets the stage for a thorough discussion of Quine's naturalism, and in particular, his naturalized epistemology. Questions about the famous two dogmas are raised, and then attention is drawn to his doctrines of extensionalism and ontological relativity. We now join the discussion in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Joining Professor Quine for this discussion are Warren Goldfarb, Professor of Philosophy at Harvard University, Paul Horich, Professor of Philosophy at MIT, and Martin Davies, Wild Reader in Mental Philosophy at Oxford University. In 1932, the Quines set sail for Europe. Destination was Vienna. Herbert Feigl, who was at Harvard University from Vienna at that time, had suggested to Quine, who had already achieved a claim as a logician, that the main action in logic would be found in Vienna, and perhaps in the person of Rudolf Carnap, who was ultimately to play a great role in Quine's development as a philosopher. Before going into the influence that the Vienna Circle had on your work, I'd like to ask you, what was the situation at Harvard at that time, uh, particularly in the field of logic? <clears throat> at that time, uh, logic was very weak in, uh, in America generally. <clears throat> uh, universities hardly, uh, uh, as far as I know, hardly uh, uh, any of them ha uh, taught the subject. Uh, Harvard was looked to, uh, prided itself on being uh, perhaps the, the greatest center for logic uh, in America. Um, after uh, I'd been there for a little while, I came to feel that this was, uh, well, th this uh, profession reminded me of the Wizard of Oz. Uh, there was, uh, I, I, I was learning virtually no logic that I hadn't already uh, uh, imbibed as, uh, uh, as an undergraduate from my unsupervised honors reading. Who, the, <clears throat> who were the main characters at that time at Harvard? Uh, the, uh, in logic, the three names, uh, the three names associated with, uh, with logic were uh, Whitehead, uh, Clarence Irving Lewis, and Harry Sheffer. Uh, Whitehead, of course, with uh, uh, very good reason, because he and uh, Bertrand Russell had done this monumental three-volume work of, on mathematical logic, the, the work that uh, was far and away the uh, uh, greatest thing in that subject and uh, uh, virtually the only great thing that I'd become aware of up to then. Um, Lewis had done a, uh, many years earlier, in fact, uh, as far back as 1918, the book had appeared, a survey of symbolic logic uh, in which he, uh, he did a good job of uh, 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 reporting the, uh, uh, and reporting the uh, uh, developments in, uh, at the hands of uh, Peirce and Boole and the others, and to some small extent, perhaps, Frege. Um, his teaching, he was perhaps my most influential teacher from the point of view of straight classroom uh, contact. Um, his course in Kant and his course in his own uh, theory of knowledge. Um, he, he wasn't teaching logic. Uh, what uh, uh, little uh, logic I associated with him from reading, I was not sympathetic with because it was modal logic. In fact, he was a, uh, very much the pioneer the American pioneer in, or the pioneer, uh, I should say, in uh, uh, the modal logic of necessity. 
Um, Harry Sheffer was the one who was giving uh, uh, logic courses, but they were uh, just uh, altogether too thin. And uh, there was, uh, I, I, I got no, uh, no inkling of uh, the c current uh, uh, excitement in, uh, uh, in uh, Central Europe uh, at the hands of Tarski and uh, Łukasiewicz and others, others in uh, Poland and uh, Hilbert Ackermann, Bernays uh, in Germany, uh, good again. So uh, you met Carnap in, uh, in Europe in 1932 and uh, you clearly found he had a lot to offer. In 1934 you gave a series of lectures on his uh, program of logical syntax. Those lectures are very sympathetic uh, to him. Uh, but pretty soon you found yourself having some differences with that program and with Carnap. Uh, I'd like to know, where did you first uh, find your differences with Carnap? What were the initial difficulties you, uh, you first found yourself running into in thinking about uh, executing the program? Yes. The, the, uh, uh, the, the first uh, occasion, uh, apparently, and I didn't learn this until just within the past few years, uh, was uh, as far back as, as uh, March 1933. When I was there with Carnap and was uh, getting so much stimulation and uh, uh, and uh, uh, knowledge of ph philosophy from him, um, I didn't know that until it was turned up by Neil Tennant in uh, a log that Carnap had uh, kept in his methodical way, uh, where uh, in the Day after day in Prague, when he, when he wasn't going in to lecture, I would, uh, would go out to, to uh, where he lived and uh, um, we would discuss, because I was reading his logical syntax of language uh, in, the, in the German edition uh, as it came out of the typewriter. It hadn't yet appeared. It wasn't to appear for another year. Uh, Carnap entered in this log that uh, I had expressed uh, uh, some uh, questions about uh, uh, analyticity, some doubt about it, uh, and uh, he, his reflection was that perhaps I was right in thinking, uh, I'm not sure how, how accurately I remember this three or four line passage, but uh, perhaps I was right in thinking that it was a matter of degree. Um, the, uh, uh, until this recent uh, uh, archaeological uh, discovery, uh, I thought of uh, 1935, when I was writing Truth by Convention that came out in 36 for a festschrift for Whitehead um, as being my first, at least first manifestation, certainly, of that doubt. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, th then by, uh, certainly by 39, 40, uh, it had become uh, uh, really quite a, quite a, Firm doubt, and not just a uh, ju not just tentative misgivings. I'd like to ask you about your attitude towards the uh, positivist doctrine that metaphysics is meaningless. In discussing the so-called inverted spectrum hypothesis, uh, the hypothesis that, for all I know. Other people are seeing red things the way I see green things and vice versa. Uh, in reaction to that, you said you thought this hypothesis um, would be unverifiable and therefore meaningless. And this sounds exactly the sort of thing that the hardline positivist would have said. Um, does this show oh, it, that you are, in fact, a hardline no. positivist in this respect? Uh, I, I, no, I can agree this is exactly what the hardline positivist would have said. Uh, no, I wouldn't say it, or I wouldn't mean that anyway. Uh, 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 what I perhaps uh, what I perhaps said, perhaps I started out saying that that for one thing, uh, it's unverifiable, and then I uh, should have gone on to say whether I did or not uh, that uh, 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 I can't even see how uh, by connecting it up with uh, other uh, hypotheses, uh, fit getting it into the network the, of the, the the web of belief. Uh, that it would uh, link up indirectly with verification, uh, that uh, it, it seemed to be simply uh, inaccessible to scientific uh, uh, 
foreseeable scientific developments that we can project, that we can imagine and foresee. And that, it seems to me, should qualify something that purports to be a statement uh, or a question of fact uh, as, uh, as uh, meaningless in the positivist way.